let's do this. Basically, as I said before, previously, I loved your first book. I thought it was fantastic. I love the podcast. I think it's great. I think younger people are in a similar position towards a lot of your writings for Lost Connections. And it's going to be a similar scenario with your new book t- today for Stolen Focus. So it's going to be awesome, man. And I'm excited. Woohoo! Let's do it. Let's do it. So basically, okay. to go into kind of the nutshell at the beginning, why was it really that you started, you know, Stone Focus? Because I know your other books are focused on anxiety and depression. So this is kind of a, a little bit of a tangent, but I suppose there's a lot of similarities. So what was really the kind of idea, do you think? You know, there was this moment when I realized I had to write the book. Um, so when he was nine, I had a godson called Adam who um, became totally obsessed with Elvis Presley. I don't know how he stumbled across Elvis. It might have been on telly or on YouTube or something. Um, and he started just obsessively, for like a week, you know, the way nine-year-olds do, he started obsessively impersonating Elvis. And he didn't know that that style was like a bit of a cliche. So he was doing it totally sincerely. And, um, and, and he kept getting me to tell him the story of Elvis's life, right? So I told him the story about how, you know, Elvis was born in Mississippi and uh, he becomes really rich and he buys his mother this palace and calls it Graceland. And I tried to skip over the bit where he shits himself to death on the toilet. And, um, and, and I would get him to just sing Blue Moon with me instead when we got to that point. But, but at one night when I was tucking him in, he said to me, Johan, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he's like, do you promise? And I'm like, yeah, I promise. In the way that you give promises to children, knowing that I'll just forget them the next week, right? Uh, so I promised him that. And I didn't think about any of that again until 10 years later when a lot of things had gone wrong. So Adam um, was 19 by then. He dropped out of school when he was 15. And he seemed in that decade, like a lot of people to have kind of fractured into smaller parts of himself. So he would just obsessively alternate between his laptop, his iPad and his phone, right? And it, his life just seemed to be a kind of blur of, um, you know, WhatsApp and YouTube and porn. And um, it, it was like nothing gained any traction in his mind. He's a really nice, it was a really nice person, but, but it, it's like his mind was whirring at the speed of Snapchat. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the reasons I found this so sad and so anxiety provoking is that I'd seen it happen to so many people, right? In that decade, it felt like people's attention had got much worse. Anyway, one day we were lying on my sofa here in London and I was looking at him just scrolling and scrolling and fucking alternating between these screens. And I I myself was scrolling through a screen and felt this sort of discomfort. And I said to him, let's go to Graceland, right? And he was like, what? He didn't even remember that he'd, I'd made this promise. And I was like, no, no, let's go to Graceland. I was like, something's got to break this numbing routine in his life, right? Um, so I said, I'll take you to Graceland. We'll fly there. We'll go all over the South. But it's one condition, which is that you, you, every day you leave your phone in the hotel. I can't take you. And you just be constantly looking at your screen. It'll do my head in, right? And he made this promise. And a couple of weeks later, we, we set off from Heathrow, right? And when you arrive at the gates of Graceland for a tour, there isn't a human being to show you around anymore. What happens is they they hand you an iPad and you put in earphones, just like the ones you're wearing now, and the iPad guides you around. So it says, you know, go left, go right, and it tells you about where you are. Mm -hmm. And so we're walking around. We've traveled like 3,000 miles, and we're walking around, and everyone, we're just surrounded by all these blank faced people staring at their iPads, right? And I keep trying to make eye contact with someone to go, oh, this is really, we're the two people who are actually looking around, right? And finally someone makes eye contact with me, they look down, they look up from their iPad, they look at me and I'm about to say it. And then I realize that they only put their iPad down so they can take out their phone and take a selfie. And I'm just like, oh, fucking hell. Anyway, we get to the jungle room, which is the, was Elvis's famous room in the mansion. It's got, it's like a fake jungle basically. And, In the jungle room, there's this couple standing next to us. And the guy turns to his wife, staring at the iPad, and he says, honey, this is amazing. If you swipe left, you can see the jungle room to the left. And if you swipe right, you can see the jungle room to the right. And she goes, wow. And they start both swiping. And I turned to this guy and I just said, but sir, there's an old fashioned form of swiping you could do. It's called 
turning your head because <laughs> we're actually in the jungle room. You don't have to look at it on the iPad. We're, we're literally in that very room, right? And he just sort of looked at me like I was insane and they just both walked out. And I, and I turned to my godson to, to be like, laugh about it. And he was just standing in a corner looking at Snapchat because he'd been doing that the whole fucking time we'd been on this trip. And I, and I just lost it. And I was like, God, you think you're, you know, you're afraid of missing out, but this is guaranteeing you will miss out, right? You can't be present with the things that are right in front of you. And he just, he stormed off. And I found him later that night in the Heartbreak Hotel where we were staying, which is across the street from Graceland. Uh, he was sitting next to a, a swimming pool that was shaped like a guitar where they constantly play the Elvis song, Suspicious Minds in a loop. And he just said, look, I know something's really wrong, but I don't know what to do about it. And just carried on looking at his phone. And that was when I realized, okay, I need to figure out, is something really going wrong with our ability to focus and pay attention? If it is, what is it? So I end up traveling all over the world. I need to be the leading experts in the world about focus and attention. And I, I think I figured out the core of what's going on here. After, you know, after doing all that research and after looking around, but it's, but it's interesting because like, is it necessarily the tech? Is it the fact that you can access Pornhub on your phone? Or is it the fact that, you know, you ne didn't necessarily have it? And this is the kind of route that I want to get to is the fact that like, of course, like it's shiny penny syndrome. You can stroll around and see the best apps, but has it just been a generational shift because now we have more access to information or let's say for instance, if you went to this Elvis place when you were young would you have found other alternatives do you get me so is it a more diminishing effect on our actual generation versus the actual platforms themselves so what i learned is that there's scientific evidence for 12 factors that can boost or degrade your attention your ability to focus and pay attention and most of those 12 factors have been rising all throughout my lifetime right uh, and so we really do have a crisis in the ability to focus and pay attention there was a study in the US that found the average American university student now focuses on any one thing for 65 seconds and the average um, office worker now focuses on any one thing for three minutes. And there's loads of evidence this has degraded our attention. But it's important to understand this isn't a generational, I don't think this is a generational shift. It's not like, if you think about a generational shift from, I don't know, the, the baby boomer from, from um, 1940s parents to the baby boomers, right? Where they just had a different attitude towards sex and, you know, all sorts of things, right? That's the generational shift. Yeah, this isn't, yeah, exactly. There was the a generational shift there in attitudes. This, I think, is much more, the thing, I think the most important thing people to understand, I think, is that your attention didn't collapse. Your attention has been stolen from you. It's been stolen from you by big forces that we can understand uh, and we can resist and we can actually take on these forces. It, it, it's not that, oh, you know, we just have a different attitude towards these things. I mean, clearly there's some element of that. That's true of every generation. But most of it is actually these really big invasive forces that are fucking with people. Now, some of that is tech. Some of that is the specific way the current tech is designed, which is different to just tech itself some of it's the specific design but then there's a lot of things that are not related to tech or are only slightly related to tech which are also fucking with our ability to focus and pay attention for example the food we eat our, our, our current diet massively degrades your ability to pay attention and focus so there's a huge range of things that, is, that are causing this and the first step is we have to understand this but also we have to think differently about it. So for me, and for most of the people I know, when my attention started to fail, I would go into a very negative kind of, I'd start reproaching myself. I'd be like, oh, you're just lazy. You're being thick, you're weak-willed. Why aren't you strong enough? Um, but actually what's happening to us is much deeper than personal failure or just one, you know, um, just one new invention, right? This is, this is a deeper, attentional attack on all of us and where where is that really stem from so i know there's a lot to unpack here so if you're going back to the very very core and let's say we just focus on the tech so is that really focusing on let's say preying on the individual's kind of insecurities and what they are more susceptible to because let's say if it's um situational based and let's say if it's a male or a female say females at home swiping on instagram and they're depressed looking at all their good looking friends and stuff and they're in that negative rut of their head. Is that what's kind of like become making them more essentially enthralled in these apps and then making them completely 
neglect other aspects of their life versus you I mean, know no, someone who has a good and active lifestyle the situation you're describing is definitely real but i don't think that's the main uh, and that happens to lots of people and of course we all know people have been in that position i don't yeah. think that's the main thing we're thinking about attention right um so there's, there's lots of aspects of this but let's start with a very simple one that is one of the ones that most fucks with your ability to pay attention i'm all right to swear by the way aren't i you can do whatever fuck you want. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, it's funny with uh, um, uh, Australians and Irish people. I always feel like I can swear freely. My mother is Scottish, so my mother swears constantly. If you said to my mother, "How do you get to the post office?" she'd say, "I you see, go left or here. Go right. You'll see a bunch of cunts standing there. Go right where they are. What? Then take another left. You'll see another bunch of cunts. That's the post office, right?" So That's I'm exactly glad that I can speak freely. But uh, <laughs> so let, so let's look at. What, uh, let's start with one of the causes of um, that, that, that screws with your ability to pay attention. There you go, that's toning down my swearing. It screws your ability to pay attention uh, that relates to technology, right? So I went to interview one of the leading neuroscientists in the world, a man named Professor Earl Miller, who's at MIT in the US. And um, he said, you've got to understand one really important thing about your brain. You can only think about one thing at a time. Currently, lots of people think they can think about lots of things. So there was a study found um, the average teenager believes they can follow six forms of media at the same time, right? But what happens is when you think you're focusing on lots of things at the same time, you think you're following the TV show, you're looking at Snapchat, you're, you're listening to your friend. What you're actually doing is you're, and neuroscientists have shown this, you're actually juggling between those things, right? So you're switching between those things very rapidly. But that comes with four really big costs. So the first is what's called the switch cost. So say I'm, we're currently talking, right? But let's say now, I don't know where my phone is in this room, but let's say I deliberately put it away somewhere before talking to you. But let's say that I now, when well, I'm talking to you, I just glanced at my text messages, right? You think, oh, okay, that's going to take a second. I can do that. In the second, which I, I look at the text message, my mind refocuses on the text message and then refocuses on you. That takes up a significant amount of brain power. Now your brain papers over it, but you don't feel it. But that takes a significant amount of your brain power. The fancy term for that is the switch cost effect. Switching between things causes a mental cost to your attention. The second thing is it produces what's called the screw up effect, where when you switch between things, you start to make mistakes, right? Because if I look at my text, I am like, oh, wait, what was Darren saying again? Oh, right. So I'm talking about switches, right? Okay, I get it. But when you do that, you start to make mistakes and then you have to backtrack to correct your mistakes. That's another cost to your attention. The, the third cost is to your memory. So we, your brain has to uh, translate the experiences you have into memories. And that takes a certain amount of mental energy, right? If your brain is jammed up with switching between things, you significantly reduce the amount you'll actually remember of what you're doing. And the fourth effect is a, a kind of more medium term effect, which is about your creativity. So when you're not jammed up, your brain will just start to wander over things that have happened to you, things you think might happen in the past, stuff you've seen, stuff people have said to you, and it will start to combine those things in creative ways, right? That's what creativity is, just seeing connections between things that other people haven't seen. But if your brain is jammed up with all these switch costs, right? Switching, switching, switching. What was I just saying? What was he saying? What was that on Snapchat? What's going on here? Your creativity will massively degrade. And this isn't a small effect, right? So Hewlett Packard, who uh, the company that make printers, shit printers that always break in my experience, <laughs> but whatever. Um, Hewlett Packard did a study where they got their workers, they split them into two groups, right? It was a fairly small study, but they split them into two groups. And one group of workers was told, just do your work and you're not gonna have any interruptions. And the second group was told, um, <clears throat> we're gonna, you're gonna receive text messages and emails that will interrupt you. I don't think they're actually told that, it just happened, right? And they were given IQ tests. And the people who were being interrupted tested 10 points worse on IQ tests than the people who were not being interrupted because it lowers your intelligence to be constantly interrupted. To give you a sense of how big 10 IQ points is, if you if you or me spoke to, spoke to Spliff now, it would lower our IQ by five, five points. So being distracted all the time is twice as bad for your ability to pay attention, focus and be intelligent as getting stoned. You would be better off sitting at your desk smoking a fat spliff than you would sitting at your desk and just doing one thing than you would sitting at your desk being constantly interrupted, right? What I'm just thinking around this is the fact that like with work, the modern day work, work from home, you're just getting absolutely fucking bombarded 
by Slack number one, Slack or whatever sort of channel you have on these people coming in. So even if you are trying to focus on your work, it's so difficult because maybe you might send me a message saying, hey, we're, we're fucked, we need to sort something out. Or else I could be in 50 other Slack channels that pushes it in. And then you have the aspect then of your phone. So then you're checking your phone then and like my phone is always on the table, rightly or wrongly. And uh, when that's coming in, then you're essentially removing the ability to remember stuff and you're removing the ability to do work effectively. And that's where you always see errors happening and big errors or small errors. And it's kind of compounded over a, you know, a sustainable period of time. And people become numb to it, almost numb to it. Well, it's become so much our reality that we don't feel it. It'd be like if we were stoned all the time and we all know people who are stoned all the time after a while, they don't really notice they're stoned, right? <laughs> and in the same way, we, we are all like that, right? And if you think about it, that one of the really important implications of this research on switching is that one of the things it means is that, um, so say you look at your screen time on your iPhone and it says you spend three hours a day looking at your phone, right? If that is spread throughout the day, because you look at that and you think, oh, I've lost three hours today. Well, that's bad. But actually, if that three hours was spread throughout the day, you've lost much more than three hours in lost focus. There's a study by a guy called Professor Michael Posner at the University of Oregon that found if you are interrupted while you're doing something, it takes you 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus you had before you were interrupted, right? Now, most people are being interrupted all the time. They never get back to that level of focus, right? Mm -hmm. So we're in this sort of haze of constant distraction. And it's important to understand. So some of that is what you're describing, things like Slack. That's just um, employers just getting it wrong, right? <laughs> that That's... That's employers getting it wrong, right? That's employers profoundly misunderstanding how to get work out of their workers. But a lot of the distraction and interruption we're experiencing is by design so that other people can profit, right? And it's really important to understand this about the current business model of social media. Um, so I interviewed a lot of the kind of people who designed the social media in which we now live, who regret a lot of what they've done. And one of the ways into it that really helped me was just to start with a really basic question, right? Facebook will tell you loads of things. If you opened your Facebook now, it will tell you everyone's birthday. It'll tell you who tagged you in a photo. It'll tell you what you were doing on the same day five years ago. It'll tell you if there's been a terrorist attack and your friends have checked in. What it doesn't have is a button that just says, are any of my friends nearby and want to meet up, right? Now you think that would be a really, that's very technologically easy to design that button. That'd be a really popular button, right? Lots of times you're sitting at home, you're thinking, oh, I, wish, I wonder who's free right now. Facebook won't tell you that. Why doesn't it tell you that? Given that it would be really popular, given that I'm guessing everyone listening is thinking, oh, that'd be a useful thing. Why won't it tell you that? It's for a simple and crucial reason that I think helps to explain a lot about our attention. When you open Facebook, Facebook makes money for two reasons, in two different ways, right? The first way is obvious. You scroll down, you see the adverts, the advertisers pay Facebook. Okay, that doesn't need much explanation. The second way is everything you do on Facebook is analyzed and sorted by Facebook. Everything you like, uh, the kind of words you use, you message your mum saying you're going to go and buy nappies. Oh, then the person, then Facebook thinks, oh, this is a person with small children. Go down the list. They're constantly building a very detailed profile about you that they then sell to advertisers so that ad those advertisers can target you, right? So if it was nappies, okay, the companies that sell nappies can target you and not me because I don't have kids, right? So it can go, so every time you close Facebook, both of those revenue streams go away, right? Obviously, you're not looking at Facebook. That's why they won't have that button because if that button was there and you could push it and it go, oh, Joe's around the corner and he wants to go for a pint, you go, oh, I'm going to put Facebook down. I'm going to go see Joe, right? Yep. What it shows us, and you wouldn't be interacting through screens. What it shows us is that Facebook's entire technology, and this is true of all the social major social media companies, has to be designed to keep you glued to the screen for as long as it possibly can, right? That's the, that's the entire business model. In the same way that KFC's business model is to get you to buy fried chicken, their business model is to prevent you from ever putting down that screen. Now, to do that, they do all sorts of things. We can talk about them. Their whole algorithms are designed to keep you scrolling, to keep you angry, to keep you upset, because that keeps you scrolling longer. Comes back to your the example you were giving of people, you know, getting depressed, looking at everyone else's life. Um, that they, they're, they're, they're constantly um, 
tracking us and figuring out how best to do that to us. They're sending us constant interruptions throughout the day, notifications. I had this amazing moment with Tristan Harris, who's a former Google engineer, who mm -hmm. described this really creepy moment in his life. He was working on the design of Gmail when it first came mm -hmm. out. And one day he was in the Googleplex, the Google HQ, and one of, the, one of his fellow designers, a nice person, someone he liked, said, why don't we make it so that every time someone receives an email, their phone vibrates a little bit? And everyone said, oh, that's a good idea. And the next week, Tristan was walking around San Francisco and he just hears these vibrations all around him and realizes that was happening all over the world. He adds up the sum and he figured out that his colleagues had created 11 billion interruptions per day at that point, it's much bigger now, to people all over the world. Think about the effect that had on people's ability to focus and pay attention, right? So we've got to understand that these models are designed to invade and fuck up your attention. That's the point of them. Your distraction is their fuel, right? And what's awesome about the way we, you've discovered that is the fact that those are the elements that people don't anticipate. So we all understand the photos, like the videos that we're trying to stay attached to, but like that haptic feeling of looking at Gmail is something you would never anticipate or the feeling of, you know, refreshing the feed, for instance, on different platforms. So it's kind of like how they're improving the stickiness, which is the kind of element of software here, but how they're keeping them actually really entangled in that one application. Now that must have huge implications for how things are going forward as well, because the way the tech was when you were, you know, a bit, when you were first kind of starting out looking at this has dramatically improved. And now it's gone into a model that, you know, we're getting more and more interactive with it. Obviously COVID was a rise to this as well, but even though people are more aware of it, it seems like that it's going more and more inclusive. And now it's becoming more that you're actually going to be centered in this app for, for longer. Oh, it's getting more and more, you're totally right, Darren, it's getting more and more invasive. So um, Facebook recently patented a form of technology that could read your emotions through your camera and would be able to integrate that into Facebook, right? So you think about we're just at like the, in fact, I interviewed this guy called Jaron Lanier, who's a tech designer and um, brilliant tech designer. And he used to be a um, consultant for science fiction films where they're like about fucked up visions of the future, like Minority Report or whatever. And he stopped working for those films because he said, I kept designing these horrific ideas for technology and people would watch the film and go, oh, that's a really good idea. How do we do that? And he's like, no, no, that's not what I fucking meant, right? Um, so there's, there's, <laughs> it's important to understand both the ways in which this fucks up our attention, but also what we can do about it, which is the most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, the, if you want to think about ways in which it fucks up our attention, there's lots of ways. So one is the one we've talked about. It makes you switch tasks more, right? You're sitting there doing your work, get a message going, oh, look, someone's tagged you in a photo. You think that's going to take a few seconds. On average, when you click on that, it takes 12 minutes to get back to what you were doing, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of lost focus throughout the day. Secondly, it makes you crave re the rewards that it gives, right? Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you start craving likes, you start craving hearts, you start craving all these, like, you know, rewards that the system Vanity gives metrics. you, right? Exactly. And if that's taken away from you, like the, my book, I, I spent three months totally off the internet and without a smartphone. And I had a real crash because I'm used to getting all this feedback, right? And when that's taken away from you, there's a real feeling of like, the, it's almost like the world has gone silent, right? And you have to learn to read the signals of the, the kind of meat world again, right? So that, that's another way in which it um, fucks your fucks your attention another way is what you might call like fracking so fracking is the way that they drill a particular kind of gas but what happens is these apps figure out because they're constantly learning this information about you they figure out how to best hack your attention right so uh, for some people it might be that what keeps them scrolling it, you know for me it would be um you know two pictures of shirtless men one very serious video about politics one shirtless man, another serious video about politics, right? For you, it might be, you know, uh, it'll be other things, right? Uh, but we all have different things that would keep us scrolling, right? Um, and it learns exactly what they are. So it's learning how to frack your head specifically. 
Um, and the, the other way in which it, it fucks our attention is because these apps are designed to keep you scrolling, um, and so they just figure out what make, keeps you scrolling. There's a, a flaw in human psychology, or not even a flaw, just a feature of human psychology that these algorithms quite quickly figured out, which is we will look at things that make us angry longer than we look at things that make us feel good. Everyone who's had the experience of driving past a car crash knows what that's like, right? You stare at the car crash longer than you stare at the nice flowers the side of the motorway, right? Why is that? It's probably because when we evolved, you had to keep an eye out for the things that might hurt you, right? So it makes perfect sense. That you, 10, 10 week old babies will stare longer at an angry face than a happy face. Why? Because the angry face is threatening, right? It's probably quite smart to pay attention to threats more than nice things, right? But the problem is when that gets translated into the, onto these apps, it means we end up living in a kind of mental space that makes us angrier and angrier and angrier. So for every angry Facebook status update you do, you double the number of likes and shares you get for that Facebook update. So if you're the one who goes, um, went to a party today, had a really nice day, had a really nice night, everyone looked good. Okay, you might get some likes. If you go, went to a party tonight, that fucking bitch was getting off with my, you know, with, with my mate's boyfriend and she looked like a right slag, the algorithm will select to highlight and promote that over the nice comment. So it's a system rigged to promote anger, which is why one of the reasons, there are lots of reasons, but one of the reasons why we're living in a much angrier environment now than, than we were five years ago, 10 years ago, right? Because it's just so divisive and that's exactly it. They just divide and then put people in diff different silos. But what's funny is that it's always the minority that gets the lo loudest voice. So if it's that person that's given, given out shit about someone, they get promoted the most. And it's the people that are giving out most that are getting that line light. And that's where it's like, oh, fuck, you know, Twitter's a place people come and all give out and fight and stuff. But it's like, no, it's only like 1%, especially when you're taking in terms of politics and like the US election is a perfect example of that, where they just create fire. And I suppose totally. that's just how, but it's interesting because you have that model, okay, which is like the Facebook, um, Twitter kind of approach. But then you have the other model, which is like the TikTok, where it's like you could be fucking anyone and you could just go up and just put something that's highly viral and highly entertaining. And then we'll try to catch you on that model. So it's not necessarily like we're trying to divide you. It's just the fact that we're just trying to show you something on the internet. Yeah, and there's definitely lots of good things about social media as well, right? Loads of really good things. And it's important to stress there's both good and bad. But the important thing to understand is that we can have all the good stuff without the bad stuff if we change the business model, right? So the, the, um, so to give you a, a kind of analogy, in the 1970s, it was discovered. So a lot of people at that time painted their house with lead paint. It was just paint that had lead in it, right? And at that time, petrol had lead in it as well. And then it was discovered that if you breathe in lead, it really fucks up your ability to pay attention. It damages your brain, right? Actually causes, it damages your attention. It makes you more likely to be violent. There's all sorts of really bad shit that happens when you breathe in lead. And so we banned lead in paint, right? Now we still paint our houses. You're in a room that was painted. I'm in a room that was painted. We just don't paint it with lead, right? In a similar way, um, you can have social media, but not this business model, right? So think about this business model, which has to be about invading your attention. Right. So it doesn't matter if the people who run Facebook are nice people or cunts. It's irrelevant. What matters is they've got one business model and they will be fired if they don't maximize profit for their shareholders. Right. That's the business model. But we can have a different business model. Um, so we could we could just say, just like we banned lead in pain because it fucks up people's ability to pay attention. We could ban a business model that is based on secretly monitoring you, invading your attention and selling your attention to the highest bidder. We can just ban it. Right? So what happens the next day if we do that, right? Facebook doesn't disappear. You don't open Facebook and it says, sorry, we've shut down, right? Mm -hmm. What would happen would be they'd have to move to another business model. And there's loads of business models that we're all familiar with that work differently. So it could be a subscription model like Netflix. Maybe you could pay 50 cents a month. Um, and, you know, and then, or maybe uh, it could be a model like the sewers, right? So everyone listening to this, somewhere near you, there's a sewer. You own that sewer, right? We own the sewers together because before there were sewers, you used to get shit in the streets and people died of cholera. And then we all together built the sewers and we own the pipes together, right? We might want to say, okay, just like we need sewage pipes, we also need information pipes. 
And at the moment, we're getting the sort of equivalent of cholera for our brains. Actually, we should own those pipes together. They could have some form of public ownership. The important thing about that is when there's a different business model, the whole thing can be designed with different goals in mind. The goal at the moment is to hack your attention. But the goal could be to help you connect with people that you want to connect with. Think about that button. Where are my mates? Do they want to meet up, right? Mm -hmm. The whole thing could be designed to help you heal your attention instead of fuck with your attention. It could be designed that instead of interrupting you 20 times a day, seeing someone tagged you, it could uh, stop doing the interruptions. And when you, when you do get to see a link, it could say a little box could appear going, you think this will only take you a second, but actually it'll take you 12 minutes. Are you sure you want to click on this link, right? You can think of all different ways in which it could be designed to protect and heal your attention, not raid and destroy your attention, right? But to do that, we've got to change the business model. They're not going to do that on their own. We've got to pressure them. We've got to have political movements to pressure them and take on these forces. And my book is called Stolen Focus because our attention has been stolen from us by these big forces. I actually don't think tech is the biggest. We can talk about some of the others. But, um, but, but um, we've got... To, to take on these forces and stop them doing this to us. Now, there are lots of things we can do as isolated individuals, and I talk about them a lot in the book, I do them as well, but we've got to have two layers of response to this. We've got to have the personal layer of response and a bigger collective layer of response, because um, at the moment, it's like someone's pouring itching powder all over us, and we're going, and the person pouring itching powder is going, you know, you might want to learn how to meditate. Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> Fuck Fun you, way. I'll learn how to meditate when you stop pouring itching powder over me, you cunt, right? But the, it's because the, the influence is so much higher than what the, on an individual basis, you know? Like, instead of, like, us banding together and trying to walk away from that model, like, their influence is so much more. So unless you actually have, you were saying there were different ideas, like, what you were describing was a decentralized approach. Now, not what I'm going into that fucking detail of it, but that's really what it is, whereby nobody owns it. We all come together in a social network. We all come and interact. Me and you can record podcasts or we can do whatever we want. And then we leave and there's no ownership. That's like an actual alternative. And that's actually a viable alternative because it's it seems like then that no one's benefiting. There's no intermediary and no middleman, you know. But I think you do need that third party because people like to be directed. You have to think, think about that as well, you know. People like getting online and you know, people tell them what to do and things like this and need to be carried into certain areas. So there needs to be that kind of verdict versus me and you saying, let's fuck Facebook and go down to our own route, you know? No, no, but that's, it's really important because I'm not saying um, let's get rid of Facebook. I'm saying let's have Facebook, but have it work in a different way, right? And it's important to understand this isn't, an, sometimes this is framed as, I know you're not doing this, but sometimes it's framed as, um, Oh, are you pro-tech or anti-tech? And so I, can, I know some people are going to say, oh, my book is anti-tech, right? It's, this is absolutely the wrong way of thinking about it. It's not, are you pro-tech or anti-tech? It's what tech working in whose interests for what purposes, right? Now, I want tech that works to help to heal our attention and focus and connect us. At the moment, we have tech that's designed to invade and fuck our attention and to divide and anger us, right? So the question isn't pro or anti-tech, it's what tech? right and and in a way if we if it is framed as anti-tech it just lets all the tech companies off the hook because we're not going to become the amish and all fucking ditch technology nor do we want to right all sorts of incredible things about technology and all sorts of really positive advances and many things that are better now than in the past as a result of technology i think about something as basic as i'm gay and you know the ability of gay teenagers to find each other now is so much greater than it was when I was when I was a teenager, right? So there's been all sorts of incredible advances. Um, we can have those really good advances without all this shit, right? If we fight for it and demand it. And these big changes are totally possible, right? I mean, they're, they're, they are absolutely achievable. Um, there've been really big changes in societies before. Uh, we, we can absolutely win them. Mm -hmm. it just takes like a bit of a change of focus i think that's the main thing and that's what brings it back to the core you know i want to get into some of the other aspects as well you mentioned yeah. whichever particular one that you think is a uh, most important so there was an important study you did that was based in rio in brazil which i think is pretty interesting i have to kind of dig into some of that or what's your aspect on maybe the, the food element because someone who has a background in nutrition and fitness as well i know firsthand when people are literally taking the pace and as a result 
has screwed the productivity, has screwed pretty much any sort of alignment that they want to have. Yeah, so we all know that, um, so I always think about this relationship thing that happened to me. So my dad was from Switzerland, uh, a tiny mountain in a Swiss village, in a Swiss village and I grew up in, in like London, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So the world he grew up in was totally fucking alien to me. And when I was like, starting from when I was nine, every summer, he would fucking banish me that cunt to go to live with his parents on this mountain. And uh, he'd go, go, go to the mountain, you will become a man, he would say. <laughs> and so I would turn up as this little London kid with like a little pile of books. And my grandfather would be like, what the fuck is this? Um, <laughs> but, uh, and he'd try to get me to like fucking, you know, empty out cow sheds. And I'd be like, I'm going to fucking sit here and read a book. <laughs> fuck off. But, um, and listen to my Walkman, but the, but there was this really big division where I grew up, right? My, my, I was raised by my grandmother, who, my other grandmother, who was Scottish, um, who was a working class Scottish woman. So I was basically raised on microwave meals and, you know, fries and Kinder Red chocolate, right? And so, I, so that was what I thought food was, right? And so I arrive on my grandparents' farm and they ate the way pretty much all human beings had eaten going back the origins of human beings they ate the food that they grew and killed themselves right so they ate what we would think of as completely organic food but like literally they you know and so i they would put this food in front of me and i would literally say when i was nine that this isn't food where is the food right because i didn't recognize it as food and i would beg and i just didn't eat for the first like few weeks so i was like what the fuck is this and after about two weeks my grandmother ages away about two hours from that village there was a mcdonald's in zurich and so I managed to persuade her to take me. And when she took me to McDonald's, she refused to eat anything because she looked at the McDonald's and said, but this isn't food, right? Exactly what I'd said to her. So in the space of those two generations from my Swiss grandparents to me, the nature of what we eat radically changed, right? Like profoundly changed for all sorts of big reasons, right? That we've moved from fresh, nutritious food that we could prepare and cook ourselves to supermarket prepared food, which is processed, it's full of stabilizers and all sorts of things to stop it going off on the shelf. And that whole process strips it of nutrition, right? And we all know that that's caused all sorts of problems like obesity. It's incredible. If you look at a beach, a picture of a beach in Britain in 1970, right? Everyone is what we would call slim. There are n- nobody, either slim or buff, right? Nobody is what we would call fat. There was essentially no obesity in Britain or the United States in 1970. The figures are just incredible, right? And then there's this, we all know there's been this huge explosion in obesity and we don't need to, uh, your listeners don't need me to explain that. But what I didn't know until I did the research for this book is that that has also profoundly affected our ability to pay attention and think in three, in three big ways, right? The first is um, we eat in a way that causes energy spikes and energy crashes, which give us brain fog. I spent a lot of time interviewing Dr. Dale Pinnock, who's a, the leading, one of the leading nutritionists in Britain. And he said to me, look, if you put shampoo into your car engine, you wouldn't be surprised if the car engine puttered out, you know, right? It just didn't work, right? Um, because that's not the fuel that that car engine was designed for. But he said, we're doing the equivalent of that with our bodies, right? So you think about if you eat for breakfast, something as simple as like Frosties and white bread, your brain is suddenly flooded with glucose, which feels great for about 20 minutes. And then you absolutely crash and you sit at your desk at school or in the office and you just can't think and you've got brain fog because your your brain doesn't have uh, the right kind of fuel. Your energy has completely crashed. So that's one way. And what's happening is if we're eating sort of shitty carbohydrates every day, Mm-hmm. Um, and I say this with no sense of superiority. I literally have McDonald's for breakfast this morning. Um, you, you, if you're eating the shitty carbohydrates to, throughout the day, you're getting these spikes of energy and crashes, spike, crash, spike, crash, which gives you this sense of brain fog and really screws with your attention. The second way <clears throat> in which the way we eat is really uh, fucking with our ability to pay attention is um, that it, it, it um, deprives us of the nutrients that we need. So there was a really interesting study in the Netherlands where they took a bunch of kids and they divided them into two groups. Uh, One group just ate the normal Western diet and the other group was put on what was called an eliminationist diet, which basically cut out loads of the things that we currently eat, the the kind of shitty carbohydrates and all of those things. 
Um, and the kids who went on the eliminationist diet, their attention and focus radically improved. 70% of them saw an improvement in their focus and the average improvement was 50%. So there's something about the way we're eating that's depriving us of nutrients, the nutrients we need to form a healthy brain. And I remember interviewing uh, a, an expert on this, Dr. Drew Ramsey uh, in New York, who said to me, you know, if people don't get that, I would just say to them, where do you think attention comes from? The brain is built out of foods, right? If you don't put the right stuff in, you won't get the right effect. The third way in which um, this, um, the way we eat is, 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 is damaging our attention is that a lot of the stuff we eat, it's not just that it lacks nutrients, it's that it contains chemicals that actually act on us like drugs. Um, so in 2007, there was a group of scientists in Southampton in Britain who did a, a really big study. They took 297 kids, split them into two groups. And the first group was um, given a drink that contained a load of the synthetic dyes that you find in normal foods that we eat, like M&Ms, stuff like that, right? And the second group was just given a drink that didn't contain these synthetic dyes. And what they found was there was a really significant difference between these two groups. The kids who drank the dyes were significantly more likely to become manic, to run around, to find it hard to focus, compared to the kids who just drank, you know, a kind of, I forget what it was, just water, I think, right? So you can see these three different ways in which the way we eat is, is screwing on our ability to pay attention. And again, some of that we can deal with ourselves. And some of that is that from the moment we're born, we are taught to associate positive emotions with shitty food. More 18 month old children know what the McDonald's M means than know their own last name, right? So again, just like Facebook invades us, the food industry invades us with these things that are designed to be, to be addictive and compelling, right? So we, we, we can deal with that at a personal level, we can change our own diets, but also we've got to deal with the food industry um, that is feeding us, you know, stuff that isn't really food in any way that my grandparents or your grandparents would have recognized. 100%. And the biggest thing there as well is the reward system we're given to us at birth. Like, you know, when you're like a four or five year old has been good for half an hour, he'll get that M&M. And then that's yeah. going to fill him up. And like, even like I have, a, I have like a small dog, even him, if he eats at night, he's fucking running around the house crazy, you know? So that's why you yeah. limit, you know, when they're eating and that certain uh, duration period. And like someone with a, a lot of background in this particular area as well, I feel very strongly on that as well. It's because like, we're giving these kids who already filled up a fucking energy, just putting a lot of like fuel on the fire, essentially to make things. 10 times worse you know and what's ha what's worse is the fact that you can't break that cycle so like 60 day habits you know three month habits it's way more difficult to get out of that as you've gotten into it so that's why they bring in those initiatives in school but they're to a very little effect you know if you do break away from the sweet uh diet like let's say like the, what we all know to be to be wrong you're still walking into the first and second category you said there where high carb diets if it's pasta whatnot and then you're going through those slumps and periods and that's where people say like that midday slump after 1 p.m when you're sitting in your office job where you've been there since 7 a.m you slam a shitload of carbs you're back in the same position so it's not like anything has changed you know um and that's that's educational 100 percent because a lot of people even that i that, that i would know that are in this area just don't know any wiser you know it's partly education and explaining to people, you know, this is very unusual. There have been no humans before us, apart from, you know, the last 20 years. Who've ever fucking eaten. sugar, man. And with the exactly. sugar, sugar since the 70s, that's the main thing. Like, because that's when sugar was like literally invented for Americans and created all that obesity. Exactly. So it's partly education. And again, it's partly that layer of saying, OK, part of the problem at the moment is it's... Um, the food that harms our attention is cheap, it's available, and it is constantly promoted to us. And the food that heals our attention is expensive, is mm -hmm. harder to get, and, uh, and it's never promoted, right? Apart from, you know, little public health campaigns that are nothing compared to the advertising budget at KFC or whatever, right? Um, so we've got to flip that dynamic. At the moment, our government's actually subsidized this shitty bad food, right? Uh, we should be subsidizing the healthy food. The countries that do that, like, and we should be building our cities so that we can walk and bike around them. The, 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 because the healthier you get, the more you want to eat healthily. Um, the places that do that, like the Netherlands, Norway, 
have much less problems with this. So there are places that are already doing this. So again, we've got to tackle it. But this is just one of the ways in which we've been cut off from thinking about our most basic needs, right? I'll give you another really, an answer, another example that's very obvious when you hear it, but is, um, that has changed dramatically in the lifetime of my parents and your parents. So um, we sleep far less than we used to. Since 1942, the average adult sleeps one hour less than they, than they did in 1942. In the last century, the average child sleeps 80 minutes less than they do. So it's reached this very extreme level. Only 15% of us now wake up feeling refreshed, which is extraordinary, right? Um, it was one of the things that was most revealing to me when I spent those three months off the internet and I was away, is I, st A, I realized how much my body craved sleep, but I would wake up in the morning. I remember, never forget about three weeks in, I woke up and I was sort of wandering around. I was sort of thinking, what? I, I feel something really strange. What is this? And then I realized that I had woken up feeling refreshed. Like I wasn't tired, right? And I, I was like, whoa, you know, I, I don't remember feeling that ever in my adult life, right? Um, and I interviewed lots of experts on, on sleep who, who've discovered how and why sleep, lack of sleep really, really trashes your attention, right? There's a guy called Dr. Charles Seisler, who's an expert at Harvard Medical School, made this incredible breakthrough. So he did these studies where he puts people in a machine where they're awake and they, the machine tracks what their eyes are doing and also tracks what's going on in their brain. And what he discovered is when you're really tired, you can be looking around and you appear to be awake, but large parts of your brain are literally asleep, right? So you're, you appear to be looking around you, but you literally can't think about the things that you're seeing in front of you. And you don't have to be that tired to get to that stage. In fact, if you stay awake for 19 hours, um, you, your attention degenerates to the same level as if, um, as if you had got drunk, right? That's an incredible, 19 hours isn't that much. And even if you think, well, I don't pull all nighters, just a week of sleeping for six hours a night gets you again to that level where you're, you're as impaired as if you were, you were legally drunk. And there's lots of reasons for this. When you're, when you're sleeping, you're repairing, right? Your, your brain, it's, a, it's like a healthy form of brainwashing, a kind of uh, a watery fluid washes through your brain. It, carry, it carries away the, the um, what one of the experts calls sort of brain cell poop that builds up throughout the day. It carries it down to your liver and flushes it out of your system. Um, your brain can only do that when you're sleeping and it needs to repair for, you know, eight hours a night. It needs you to rest, sleep and do that. Most of us are not getting that now. We're, near, we're nowhere near it. Like we're nowhere near it. Like we're literally at six, seven, six, seven hours at a maximum. And I think it's because like the influence from Instagram or from influ influence of Slack, it's just taken completely away. So we're nowhere totally. near that level. 23% of British people sleep on average five hours a night, right? Uh, that is absolutely going to raid your ability to focus and pay attention. You know, the, 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 that, that's a... Um, and, it, and that has a whole series of effects. Um, Professor Roxanne Prichard, who's one of the experts on sleep, uh, she's at the University of Minneapolis. She said to me, you know, um, when you don't, of course, human beings evolve so we can cut back on our sleep for short periods of time. Otherwise, we would never have, you know, survived hurricanes or been able to raise babies or whatever. But when you do cut back on your sleep, your body interprets that as an emergency, right? So it does all sorts of things. It raises your blood pressure. It makes you crave more sugar and junk food to give you quick releases of energy. Um, it, it raises your heart rate and it cuts back on things like creativity, creative thinking. Cause it's like, you're in an emergency, right? You must be trying to escape a disaster. But if you live in that, that emergency for weeks, months and years, that has a really negative effect on your body, your mind, your ability to think. And we're really, and it's interesting, when I was talking to experts, I said, well, you know, is attention really getting worse? Do we know that? Dr. Seisler, one of the leading experts in the world, said to me, if the only thing that was happening was that we were sleeping this much less, that alone would mean we were having a big crisis in our ability to focus and pay attention. In fact, that's only one of 12 things that's going on. But so we've become disconnected from really core aspects of what we need as human beings, right? Um, and that's having 
all sorts of negative effects. But again, you can see that that doesn't have to that doesn't have to continue, right? We can change the way we live. There are all sorts of practical things we can do. But for me, it's so important. You can't just say to people, so for a lot of people hearing this, they'll be thinking, me saying to them, well, you should sleep two hours more a night, will feel like me going up to a homeless person and going, mate, do you know what would make you feel much better would be if you went into the Ritz Hotel over there and had a really nice dinner. And the homeless guy's gonna go, yeah, I fucking know that. I can't go into the Ritz, right? So the way we're currently living, we're, it, there's a gap between what we know we ought to do and what we feel we can do. Mm -hmm. And I think there are, what, so what we have to think about are all sorts of ways we can close that gap. We can change the way we live to get to that point. So I'll give you a very practical example of a place that did something that really helped with this. Lots of people feel they have to check their phone all day and night because their boss might contact them, right? Mm -hmm. So they feel they can't unplug. They literally can't unplug because they're worried about the effect on their employment. So in France in 2016, there was a big problem with this. They, they were having a, a crisis of what they called le burnout, which I don't think you need me to translate. Um, and so the French government set, uh, got a guy called Bruno Metling, who's the head of Orange, one of the biggest telecom companies in France, to do a report, figure out what can we do about this? What he discovered is 25% of French people felt they could never unplug right that they had to be constantly checking to see if their boss was contacting them and it was you know if you never rest it fucks up your ability to think it just fucks up your life right so uh, after studying this for a long time bruno metling uh, recommended and the french government introduced a new law very simple it's called the right to disconnect and all it says is you have a right to have written and defined work hours and you have a right that outside those work hours you don't have to you don't have to check your email you don't have to answer calls from your boss right very simple just giving people back the idea of workouts when i was a kid the only people who were on call were doctors and the prime minister now half the economy is on call all the time right so it was restoring to people the ability to, to unplug um, and you know companies now get fined so there was rent a kill for example the pest control company was fined 70000 euros for for uh, penalizing one of their workers for not answering his email when it was outside work hours, right? So you can see how I said to people, you know, it'd be really good for your attention if you rest and sleep more. And they go, fuck you, I'll lose my job. And they go, mm -hmm. you're right. You should be given a legal right to do those things. And then they go, oh, it's not a fuck you. It's like, oh, good, okay, how can we do this together, right? There's all sorts of things like that that we that we can uh, fight for together that make it possible for us to do the things that we want to do to restore our ability to focus and pay attention. Because we all know that a life, if you go through life not able to pay attention to things, you know, you, you can't achieve your goals. You can't, you, that's not a good life, right? Mm -hmm. It's drawing those lines as well, I think. So like, if you are like starting in a company and there's a lot of work I'd speak to as well, people is like setting those hard and fast rules. So if it is working 40 hours a week and if they want you to do an extra 10 hours or whatever, understand this before you go in and make that make that actual agreement you know if you need to be on slack for a certain period it's only within a certain hour, hour frame and luckily enough you can set those but everything goes out the window i think when you know shit it's a fan and, and you know we need something yesterday like that's the phrase like it wins at you yesterday you know so that's the challenge but i think that's going to be the opportunity as well for people like yourself to plug that fucking gap you know and be able to provide that awareness to people so they can go and figure it out I interviewed this guy called Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, who's a professor of organizational management at Stanford University. And he said to me something that, again, is blindingly obvious when you hear it. He said, ask anyone who supports a sports team, do you want your team to go on the pitch absolutely exhausted? No, mm -hmm. no sports team wants that. You want your players to go on the pitch feeling rested, you know, restored, right? But... What, we, what we're doing in the workforce is the opposite of what we would do with a sport team. sports team. We constantly exhaust people. And again, there are alternatives to that. So in New Zealand, I went to interview um, an amazing man named Andrew Barnes. So Andrew used to work in the city of London, the financial sector, uh, in the 80s, when they just deregulated it all. So it was this huge, like, macho scream fest, right? You've got a picture, men in suits screaming at each other across the stock exchange floor going, sell, sell, or yeah. buy, buy, whatever. He was one of those men, right? So in that world, the way they would have put it is you were um, 
a fool if you got to work later than 7.30 in the morning and you were a pussy if you left before 7.30 p.m., right? So he was just constantly working. He, in the winter, for six months, he didn't even see the sun because he would leave in the dark and he would get home in the dark, right? He, he wouldn't see his kids. He didn't really have a relationship with his children. And eventually, Andrew quit that life and he went to live in Australia and New Zealand and actually became a very successful businessman. And he set up a group called, a company called Perpetual Guardian who manage wills and trusts. And one day in, in 2018, he was looking at just reading a business magazine and he discovered that in fact, uh, there'd been a study that showed um, on average, the average worker is sitting at their desk for eight hours a day, but they're actually only focusing on their work for three hours a day, right? The rest yeah, is just sort of atrophy. So their life is passing them by, they're at their desk, but they're not working. It's, no, it's, it's shit for everyone. It's shit for the employee and it's shit for the employer. So Andrew had this idea. He said, you know, if, if we went to a four day week, right? So I paid my staff, what I currently pay them for five days for four days. And in return, each of them just worked concentrated more for 45 minutes a day. Actually that would even out, right? The four day week would be as good as the five day week. Yeah. Right? And he was conscious of all those years that he had wasted his own life, you know, not bonded with his kids. So he does this conference call with his company Company, everyone in the company says hey everyone I'm going to give you we're going to do an experiment for three months I'm going to pay you the same but you're only going to have to work four days a week and his head of HR literally fell over when he said it right and everyone was like what is this is this a trick so they they did but he said yeah we're doing it for three months and if, the comp if we do as well in as we do as well as we do now in three months we'll we'll make it permanent so I went and interviewed everyone who worked in the office in Rotorua which is this little town in New Zealand it's one of their offices it's a weird town it absolutely these stinks of farts because they have this sulfur palm. But anyway, a very nice place otherwise. Um, and it was really interesting to talk to the people because basically people rested more, they slept more, they, you know, they just felt better when they came to work. And what the company discovered after three months is that in fact they did better working four days than they did working five. And this was seen, this has been seen in loads of different companies across the world. Microsoft in Japan went to a four-day week. And their productivity went up by 40%. Toyota in Gothenburg in Sweden uh, went to a six hour day, not an eight hour day. And their profits went up by 25%, right? The mechanics there were handling 114% of what they'd handled before in five days, right? Exactly on that principle. If you're knackered, um, you're not going to work as well, right? right. So um, I think that's, again, another big fight that we can we can fight for. Sometimes you'll get an enlightened boss like Andrew Barnes will introduce it. More often, we'll have to fight for it and pressure our bosses to do it. Exactly. And that's why we need trade unions and, you know. Um, and, and That's why we need we need also a movement for, like as in, you show that example of that and then that's being used. And then you take a couple of more examples and it comes in together, you know. Because I've seen other companies, even London-based startups, they're taking that approach. Well, they're trying to and they're kind of tinkering with it but it's all driven off the numbers that come back. So if you get that, at least you have a bit of substance to say, fuck slack at 10 o'clock at night, you know, try cut it down a slightly slow. We're looking at focusing on productivity and nothing else. And I'll leave it on this note, sorry, before we wrap up, because I know you're short for time. Um, I was speaking with someone recently and someone was saying, they were working with a client and the client was like, how do you know that your employees are always like online and they're always productive? And he was like, that is like the old traditional route of looking at it. We would have originally checked our people online on the on Slack or their, their own variation of it. But now we're just looking at, is this project done? That's all we give a shit about. It doesn't matter what you do. You can go go to your kid's fucking uh, event in the middle of the day. You can go to the gym if you want to, but we're just focused on the output, you know? And it was it's a different way to look at it. Like slowly, slowly moving though, you know? Well, and that's Andrew Barnes said that to me when I, I initially went to see him in New Zealand, obviously, before the plague began. But I interviewed him um, about a year into COVID again on, on Zoom. And he said to me, look, if you had said to a major bank a year ago, would your company be able to carry on functioning if you sent absolutely everyone home and they all worked from home and you couldn't see any of them, right? Every head of a bank in the world would have said, don't be ridiculous, it's impossible. It happened, right? The banks never closed. Um, really, everything seems inevitable, that we have things have to work this way until they change. And then people go, oh, fuck. Didn't yeah. have to be like that, right? They just pivot and None adjust. of these things have to be like that. Yeah, they just pivot and adjust and move on. I know we're stuck for, for, for time, so I want to just give a small bit of a uh, moment just so you can 
Tell us where you can find your book and what date it's out. Oh, yes. So people can get the audio book or the physical book or the ebook. You go to mm-hmm. stolenfocusbook.com or any bookshop. Um, and if you go to the website, stolenfocusbook.com, you can also see, um, you can listen to interviews with loads of the people that we've talked about in this interview. You can see what a big range of people have said about the book from Stephen Fry to Hillary Clinton to Naomi Klein. Um, and um, I meant to read some fucking blurb about it, but it makes me sound. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, you can figure out where to follow me on social media, um, which I don't look at very much, So, uh, but you can follow me anyway. Um, and, um, yeah. That's it. Thank you very Basically, much. Oh, you've I'll... frozen, Darren. No worries. Oh, it's back now. I'll, uh, I'll always include all that stuff in the show notes anyway. So all that's going to be there and it's going to be pretty sweet. And uh, you know what? We'll do something another session in the future as well. Like next yeah, fucking that. book, whatever you're doing. And uh, we'll always figure it out from there, you know? Yeah, 